Now, I'm delighted to say Miola Murahartik is with us this morning on OTBAM. It's ahead of episode four of AIB's The Toughest Summer. It's a documentary telling the story of the GAA in the summer of 2020. It's made up of a series of five webisodes and a full-length documentary that's going to air on TV in late August. Miola is part of the fourth webisode. It's going to be available on AIB's YouTube channel from one o'clock on Thursday at youtube.com forward slash AIB. You can check out their uh, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook handle is at AIB underscore GA. Michal, can I just talk to you? Good morning, good morning. I'm a kloharu. That's the translation of kakuni. A kloharu, which is a very nice sound because kloharu means cosy. You know, everything is arranged. For, you're told you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do such a thing. So it's a good word, really, and I think people have accepted it. I heard about it first uh, in the month of March. Did anyone over a certain age, I think the certain age was 70 that time, they would have to cocoon. And then straight away I met a few people from the girls, oh, a e clohoro, a e clohoro, that's what we say. So I stick with that, Tom, a e clohoro. Very good. Every day is a school day, it turns out. We, we have used the time of lockdown and the absence of fresh new sport to look back on the history of sport and to re-examine how we got to where we are today in many different sports. And one of the things that we've been trying to do that we'd like to speak to you about is compare and contrast players from different eras and teams from different eras. I wouldn't say we've got it always right in terms of how you compare one era with another, but I definitely wanted to hear if this is something that you've done yourself and if you have any way that you might help us just work through how, how can we compare players from different eras? Well, uh, you, see, you see them. You see things that you never saw before happening. And in a way, you accept that as normal, maybe something else has dropped. But if sport didn't change, it would be very dull, really. What would you look forward to? Teams have new ideas. They have new ways of training and everything. And I have seen major changes. Now, I started broadcasting in 1949. And in those times, up to those times, people had to hold their position. For instance, I saw it written down by a man in charge. There was no such word as manager at the time. There is no reason on earth why the right fullback, that would be number two, would ever go beyond the 14-yard line or cross the goal or anything. That was his patch. There'd be somebody there to mark and so on. That was prevalent for a long time. Long kicking, no so, not much soloing at all. Nowadays, you know, the corner back, the number two, you could see him up in the other end of the field, scoring. Uh, changes happen. Somebody gets an idea. Somebody tries it out. I think there's no better example than the story of the solo run. Now, that wasn't in the game at the beginning. It came in the 20s, when there was a man called Lavin. Lavin was his name, Sean Lavin. He participated in the Olympics for Ireland a few times. He was a sprinter. He was other things as well. He got a ball one day in a match, played somewhere down in Mayo. He had the country wide open in front of him. All were out of position. And he was a 400-yard runner in the Olympics and so on. He saw a wide patch in front of him. I could run through that. And he decided to hop it off his toes into his hand and nobody said anything. Finished up scoring, which was accepted from then on. Changes come like that. A brainwave somebody has. He thought about using the speed I have when I got ahead of people. So that was an example of one change. I remember when they used to talk about the throw in from the sideline. Nowadays, it's a kick from the hand. It was for a while a kick from the ground and so on. There was a time there was no kicking from the sideline. When the ball went over the sideline, the team that merited the restart, that threw the ball but it had to be a one-handed throw. You know, if it was two-handed, it would be too much like rugby or soccer. <laughs> hands would use. So the GA said, well, we'd have a one hand. And there were great one-handed throws. They were so good, they had to be banned from scoring from a throw. 
as they just sling around in real athletic. Now, I didn't see it, but I heard of it. It lasted well until the 40s. The slinger, the thrower, and they'd throw it into somebody maybe 40 yards away from them by taking a big swing and letting it off. That change was there for a good while until somebody said, maybe it would be better if we kicked it off the ground. And a while later then somebody else said, oh, wouldn't it be a lot better if you kicked it from the hand? And so on. Things keep changing. You know, the players moving around. And in the book, the Dr. Eamon O'Sullivan, he was a wonderful trainer. And he spoke about every person holding their position. There is no reason in God's earth that the number four would go anywhere beyond the 14-yard line. He'd deal with who was there, pass the ball, like kick it out, just kick it out, as long as you could. They weren't trying to pinpoint it or anything, but get it out of this territory. Changes have come, you know, the free-taking is different, the catching brilliant that time. Everybody around the centre of the field, their one object was to win the ball in the air. Get it in the air and then lead it on to somebody else. Nowadays players go out of midfield with the idea of we'll stop the other person from catching it. I don't like that but it is a change that did develop. It's there. It has to be accepted. So um, change is good I think. Change is good. And no matter from what source it comes. You can pick something up from other games, and I'm sure that nothing has been picked up from soccer, and nothing from the rugby, and maybe other games that we never saw in this country. So games keep, if you like, adjusting, uh, reacting to ideas people have, the amount of training they do, the more training they do, the more of the pitch they can cover. So uh, it's wonderful to see change, but I, I'd love if the catching was what it used to be. There was nothing like people like Mick O'Connell, Brian Mullins, Paddy Kennedy, and the one-handed man from Longford, Hannafy, one time he was able to catch the ball above anyone with one hand and protect himself with the other hand. So I would love to see the clean, catching, winning of possession, man against man. That's what I really like around the centre of the field, but it has changed and... Some people go out to make sure that the opponent doesn't catch it. You don't have to catch it, but as long as he doesn't catch it, you're playing your part. But uh, change is there, and the free-taking and the kicking from the hand and the passing, of course, the hand passing. Too much of it, maybe, but the hand passing, you know, it wasn't there for a while. And then some people started. It got a, a lease of life back in the 50s. Antrim came to Crow Park in the 40s as well, and they had a hand-passing game. And they played Kerry in the semi-final of the All-Ireland in 1946, and Kerry decided before the game, there's a, no way they can be stopped unless you foul them. Just the first person to get the ball, foul them, they'd be free against you, but at least would have to be kicked, and there'd be some, more, more of a a chance of get, keeping possession and so on. So changes are good for any game and uh, we look forward to more changes in the years to come. But it's a pity, it's a summer without games, the toughest summer ever for anyone interested in sport. It's the almighty toughest of all time. But then people accept it, it has hit us, we must do our best to fight, best to fight against it. People are doing that. Wherever you go, very few people complain about the games aren't on. They, they say there's reasoning behind this. We hope it won't last too long. We'll be ready when it starts again. And the cone of day before the year is out, we are destined to see an All Ireland final on the 19th of December in Croke Park. It's not the first All Ireland final to be played on the 19th of December in Croke Park. Going back to the early years, Lots of games were played during the month of December. Get them over before Christmas comes and so on, including finals. Uh, Michal, it's interesting that you, you talk there about the art of high fielding because when Ger talks about the comparisons we've been doing of the greats, the midfield position has been one of those. And we've pondered the question, how do you compare someone like Nick O'Connell with somebody like Brian Fenton when the game is so different? Is that something you've ever considered? 
Well, the game is so different, but the catching skill is no different to what it was. Brian Fenton is a wonderful fielder of a ball, and he has the gift as well, and Mick O'Connor had it in a split second, even though there are people near them when they win this ball in the air. In a split second, the good player is on his own. He's got away rapidly. If you ever watch Fenton, seconds after having possession, he's on his own and ready to have time to take his next kick. It was the same with Mick O'Connell and other great fielders like Jack O'Shea and people from different counties all, all over Ireland. They produce great catches. And there's still a great gush of excitement that rises in the crowd once somebody pulls off a great catch, even though you get a free now for catching it. I don't entirely agree with that either. What we're trying to do is, is find a language to compare the great Kerry team with the Dublin team. And I'm not sure that we've been able to establish a way of saying one team's better than the other. What are we doing wrong? How can we fix that? You can never fix things like that. <laughs> you have people who have their own ideas. They're entitled to have them. Now, the um, Kerry won the four in a row 1929-32. to 32. They failed to win the semi-final. They were beaten in Breffney Park by uh, Cavan when they were going for the, uh, trying to win through to the final. Cavan beat them with a late goal, the same as Offaly did later. But uh, uh, the four years, you know, it's great to win four. It's better to win five. It never happened until Jim Gavin and his men, they did it. It can't be taken from them. They did a five in a row. And I think it was time, or it was time for a five in a row to be won. The honour went to Dublin. They'll enjoy that, but it's a fresh start for them from now on. But um, changes are there and uh, changes will come. But comparing them, uh, there's a, there was a lot more kicking up to the 50s. From the 50s on, the hand passing came into it more. Or the kick passing in the air defenders just let the ball out the field. They were long kickers. And in the book written by Eamon, the manager that I spoke of earlier, he mentioned, you know, that he preferred full backs. And the same thing was before them by Dick Fitzgerald. Full backs would be long kickers. And it baffled me for a long time why he fancied uh, soccer players for the half back line or for the half forward line and that the ball was to be kicked low to those there was no solo there was no way of bringing a ball except on the ground you couldn't run with it under your axle like you could in rugby so they overcame the plan by having players that would be good at soccer in the half forward line so the half backs were always instructed kick it low when you're kicking it beyond midfield and let the, the runners this would dribble it in it was their job to bring it in to feed it there you say to the inside men who were destined to take to get scores they were their scorers the center forwards and the three inside players but the suppliers all they would do win the ball keep it on the ground if you can for a while that had its day as well until they began to start catching the ball Again, the change will change slowly, maybe at times, has been there ever. Uh, it's inevitable that we'll compare eras, I think, like just because it, it's great conversation points. Uh, yes, the eras, I think an era ended in the 50s. The 40s now and before that, you know, it was more of a position game. The fullback rarely, if ever, went out the field. I never saw a fullback in those days go beyond the 14 yard line. It was the privilege of the fullback to take the kick out. The goalie's job was to place the ball for the fullback and then stand aside and let me at it. You know, there were different times. But uh, then later on, people began to venture forward. You know, players that would be anxious to be running and so on. But up to the 50s, people held their positions. From the 50s on, uh, Dublin came in the 50s. Dublin football, you could say, was dead from the 20s to the 50s. You know, there won maybe five or six All-Irelands in the last decade of the last century. 
They were the top team. They were good in the 20s. They won three in a row, 21-2-3. But after winning that, they didn't win in all Ireland again until 1942. And you could hardly say that it was a Dublin team. There were two men from Dingle playing at midfield. And there was another man from Dingle playing against them, playing for Galway. <laughs> and uh, uh, lots of non-Dublin players. So that's why football was lax in Dublin until the great St. Vincent's team came. They weren't founded till 1930. They were blossoming as the 40s went along when the 50s came. Uh, I don't think enough was made of it ever. They won a National League in 52, beating Cavan, the reigning All-Ireland champions, with 14 Vincent's players and the goalkeeper from Aircourt. Now, that was a wonderful achievement. They played with that in the All-Ireland semi-final, because they won Leinster as well in 53. They won another league with 14 Vincent men again. Dublin football really was born, reborn in the 50s and has been alive and kicking and kicking well ever since. Thanks be to God. How many capital cities anywhere in the world will you get a particular game, the national game? Gaelic football and hardly now, they're the national games of Ireland, but they really belong to Dublin people now. Dub all Dublin people now are interested in those. That's a good development, that the capital city, the number one game in that city is Gaelic football. They're not as good at hurling, but they're coming along as well. How does the current hype around the Dublin team compare with the hype and the blue wave that followed Kevin Heffernan's dubs? Uh, well, uh, there was great, uh, great rivalry in the 50s between Kerry and Dublin. It came later as well. Kerry and Dublin, you know, they, there's a bond between Kerry and Dublin going a long way back. Even though they play like hell against each other, there's that bond of friendship there ever since. And that goes back to the 1923 All-Ireland final. Dublin qualified and Kerry qualified. And Kerry said, we will not play in that All-Ireland final unless a man called Galley is released. I don't know where he was held, but he was released. Uh, they wanted him released. So then the GA began to make plans to present Dublin with the All-Ireland title and so on. Under Dublin said, we won't play either until Galley is released. And they hadn't a clue who Galley was. <laughs> they said, we won't play either until he's released. And then he was released and they played the match. And Dublin won that, the 23 one. But that bond, there's a sort of a bond between Kerry and Dublin ever since. They play like hell against each other, but they enjoy meeting each other and reminiscing about meeting them. That is a good thing. That's a good trend anywhere. So Kerry and Dublin, you know, there was great rivalry always. Kevin Heffernan was the man that I think should get most of the credit. He was the man that led Vincent. He was the man even in primary school, if you look back over all the evening Herald newspapers, they used to be full page about the schools, primary schools football. And there was a, a word there, go out every year, whatever you do, if you're playing against the school from Marino in Dublin, watch Heffo. At that stage, he was famous. He was their captain when they won the All Ireland 58 and so on. And he was with them. He played Railway Cup when he was only 19 years of age. He was a member of the Vincent's team that won their first in 49. They made it seven in a row. They lost one. They won another set. And that, that built up Dublin and it's been building and spreading all over the city. Thanks be to God ever since. And uh, uh, comparing them with the Kerry team that went before, the one difference would be the Dublin team that won the five. Uh, there were lots of changes during the one, those years. But basically, it was the same team that won the four in a row for Kerry. Very few changes. The odd one come in, not a mass of them. But they both, you know, they produced great football. They drew the crowds. There was nothing like to rouse these followers from all over the country than when Kerry and Dublin, they won 55 and later again in the 70s, 75, and they had many good games. And speaking about Kevin Heffern, I remember well 
when Kerry beat Dublin in uh, 75. I got a ring in one day from a famous parish priest and he said, we must, he was from Kerry, living in Dublin. He said to me, we must have a meeting to discuss this famous victory that we had over Dublin yesterday. So we agreed to meet. You know, he was rabid, uh, Kerry uh, and nothing else. We decided we'd play a game of golf as well. We went out with Clontarf Golf Club. And the object, for, his object was, we'll talk as we play about the match on Sunday. We went into the clubhouse in Vincent. I noticed a room near us. The entire Dublin team that were beaten the day before, they were in there. <laughs> and Kevin Heffernan was with them. And I said to the priest at the time, they are already planning for next year. They accept that they were beaten. They were doing it that soon after Lodi. It might have been the Tuesday now for all, but they were all there and Kevin Heffernan in the middle of them. We could see it in through a, a half open door there. And I said, they are preparing for next year today. And they were. And they had a great victory over Kerry in, seven, in six and seven, two in a row. And then when they were going for the three in a row, that was the birth of the new Kerry team that won four in a row. But there are phases with both of them. It's great to have them there, but it would be better again if there were more teams coming along that had beat both of them and get other teams into a final. But there's a special bond between Kerry and Dublin and I think that'll last forever. There was one last thing that we wanted to ask you about, Michal. Sean Boylan's in the, the news this week because there was a, a lovely documentary we made about him. It was on TV last week. <clears throat> Pardon me, I, I don't know if you, you saw it or not, but a lot of people really enjoyed it. It was a, a nice, gentle hour. There's been some criticism of the documentary for maybe glossing over how... Well, I, I read one and it, it certainly went too far. <laughs> miles and miles beyond, you know, what would be the uh, a good limit, but then people are different and they view things differently and it's just no harm either. But uh, it was a great range, Sean Boyle, and he explained it well during it. He knew nothing. He didn't know any footballers. He didn't know much about the game. He was a hurler who played for 21 years and managed his team as well, the, the hurling team. And then when he was asked to take over in football, a lot of people in me said, well, that's the end of Dublin for of meat football now, if that fella's taken them over. But he proved to be a great leader, and uh, he was a very likeable fellow always. I knew Sean before that. I used to meet him off. And, uh, you know, he was, he was great. He wasn't over-worried whether he was involved or not until he was asked. But if he was asked to do anything, he'd put his, as John B. Kane in one of his plays wrote, he'd give his almighty best. I think it was Castellan that was told by his father when he belted the table with a, an ash plant, give them your best, your almighty best. Whoever he was addressing, I don't know, but his almighty best. Sean, Sean Boylan always gave his almighty best and a bit more as well. I won't say it was a bit of the devil or anything like that. <laughs> it was Sean. He was, a, he was a great character. They were great years. They were great footballers a lot. Very good footballers, committed, and on their own, they're great fun all of them. You know, they they're strong men, rural men, even though they come from the towns and so on. But uh, it was a great day. It's time they come again. And they're the one team that I'd give a chance to, to rattle Dublin and Leinster this year. They might. I'm not saying they will. But they'll certainly give at it if, if they clash. It's, it's going to be a fairly unusual uh, championship, whatever happens. But Michal, it's always great to spend some time in your company. Thanks so much for being so generous with your time again this morning. Good meal, Mahalgut.